Hi everyone, and again, welcome to tonight's panel. Um, tonight's debate, which will focus on cities that have gone through conflict or currently are, is the third in a series of debates that will run through under, under the project name uh, Syrian Culture in Times of Conflict. Um, my name is Alexandra Sandals. I'm a Swedish journalist covering the Middle East. I spent about six years here, and um, now I divide my time between uh, Sweden and and here next to me is my colleague Rim Maghribi, director of Shark, um, an NGO that was founded 10 years ago, um, now working out of Lebanon for the advancement of um, yeah, and voices in the region. Um, and um, yeah, the, our project, the Syrian Culture in Times of Conflict, is funded by the, the Swedish Institute, and it's a partnership between Shark and the media firm I run in Stockholm. And for, ton and for tonight's debate, we've also teamed up with Färgfabriken, uh, an arts and culture foundation based in Stockholm. And Daniel Ray from Färgfabriken is here to give a short introduction about you guys' work. Yes, here you go. Yeah, sorry, I have to disappear. Got stuck something in here. So the Färgfabrik is a contemporary center for art in Stockholm. And uh, we work with contemporary art, but also we work with architecture. And uh, for one year ago, we created this project called Patchwork of Narratives. And what we did is to combine the history, the urban history of Mostar, the city of Mostar in Beirut, in, in Bosnia, and the urban history of Beirut. So this process we have started for one year ago, and we have been engaged in different approaches, how to interpret, how to decode the urban space. In Beirut, we created a documentary, a triptych documentary three screens with the filmmakers uh, Rania Rafay and uh, Jinnan Daher. And in Mostar, we created a culture program. Culture in Mostar, well, it hasn't been that presence. So we start to ask ourselves, what role does the culture has in order to create a dialogue? And can we talk about the city through culture? Can we engage the citizens through the culture and art to talk about their cities? And now we're here in Beirut to finalize the next second step for us, for the Fafabriken. As I say, for one month ago, we opened the exhibition in Mostar. Now we're here in Beirut. And the 29th of January, we'll open the exhibition, which will be about Mostar, Beirut, and Stockholm. Thanks, Daniel. Um, with the panel, it will run for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll, um, we'll hear a poem, and we're going to see a We'll also have a Q&A and open up the floor for discussion and questions. Um, let me introduce tonight's panelists. We have Hamad Al-Mufti, who is a uh, Syrian architect and artist who teaches at Alba, Fine Arts University here in Beirut. We have Arna Makik, who is a, an architect originally from uh, Mostar in Bosnia and now working out of Amsterdam. We have Anja Sassin, who is an urban designer slash planner here in Beirut. And last but not least, we have Kaiser Mahmoud, from, uh, who's the head of the department at the Swedish Heritage Foundation. And my colleague Reem will be moderating. So, a warm welcome to you all again. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. This is a fabulous turnout. It's good to know that people really care about rebuilding Aleppo, and hopefully one day soon we will be able to do that together. Uh, all those who are watching us via live stream, your uh, input and uh, your presence is very important to us as well. Um, some have asked why are we talking about rebuilding Aleppo now when we don't even know when the destruction will end. Uh, there are two reasons. One is because we need something to give us hope. We need to start thinking about the rebuild. At a time of destruction, there seems to be so little we can do to stop it. Um, another reason was opportunity. Farg Pragberg Fabrican are here. Um, they have studied, uh, presented a study about Beirut and Mostar, and the histories and cultures of Beirut and Mostar are not too dissimilar to the history that is currently being written in Syria and in Aleppo, um, where front lines divide societies that have coexisted for some time relatively peacefully and 
Well, we will hear from the panelists more about the similarities. Um, I'm going to be asking each of the panelists a question or two to, uh, so that we can all learn more about their thoughts on the topic. And then we're going to flow the, throw the floor open to the audience um, to, to ask questions. Um, we're going to start with Rania Sassin, who is uh, based in Beirut and is Lebanese. Um, so you are a urban designer and planner. And clearly, uh, planning the design of a city post-conflict is very important. But how is it important to community cohesion? How is it relevant? Well, we have to know that half of the city, I mean, the city is not important, is the people that are important. So we, we design, and the whole thing is how to make these people live together and have a certain quality of life. So the whole point when you're coming from a conflict city is that to make these people be able to live together again. I mean, and I think the, the whole point of having a public domain is to have this kind of generosity where people can intersect. And by intersecting, we mean the whole uh, set of public domain, which is public spaces, which is public transport, which is roads, all the spaces that are not are intrinsically offered to the public and by creating interesting public spaces and even public transport you get people and by getting people to meet you make them to understand each other and have uh, understand between each other than the differences that they have so I think the whole point is a little bit a simplistic Libra equation is how to find the intersection between people and physically it would be um, be in places where they can find this kind of intersection they, and be able to gather again on something other than their differences, which caused, in a way, the conflict. Zico House, a stone from Sanaya Park, one of the very few public spaces in Beirut. So you talk about public spaces, but is that really working in Beirut? Well, Beirut is a very particular case, uh, and I think that the I'm not sure we can talk about a phase to, of reconciliation because in a way we reconstructed some in a physical term but I don't think we worked very hard on to uh, the cohesion of people in it, in it. and uh, it wouldn't be only causes uh, differences that had caused the, the conflict in terms of sectarianism or other stuff, but also by creating areas that people uh, understand as elitist for them, so they don't go there. So I think the biggest part of, uh, I mean, we have a lot of public spaces, given that we have a marvelous nature, we have the whole seashore that is privatized, but this asset as to have the whole sea, and in the same time we have the mountain, which is also a whole green set of green area. But in a way, it's like Lebanese decided that, oh, we have the water, we have the green, so we don't need anything, let's build everything. So we don't really concentrating in having a proper public domain to be used. Or, and the, the pity is that also the people are not... I, I teach a course on public spaces, and funny enough, I ask my client, what's your favorite public space in Lebanon? And I have 70% of the responses, Starbucks. Well, it's, the, no, no, it's, it's, I think it's a very, very um, representative question. It's not that they don't know what they're talking about. It's, this is what's offered to them. The only place where they have to pay the least price for coffee and to sit for hours is a place like Starbucks. It's not a park, it's not a bench, it's not a corniche, it's not a... You, so this is what's available for them in a way. And this is where that the private has really taken over a big part of the of public domain. <laughs> Thank you, Rania. Um, how much public space is there in Mostar now? How much uh, was that considered a priority by the people who planned it? And in fact, who planned the redevelopment of the city? Well, actually in Mostar, you have to imagine that 70% uh, of the city got destroyed. And uh, after the war, actually during the war, war already, the city got divided into two different halves. So one half of the city is for Muslims, the other one is for Catholics. Um, My Sit back and 
bring it closer to you and adjust. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll ask you just to repeat so that the translator can hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So 70% of the city got destroyed during the war. The city got divided into two uh, different parts. So one is for Muslims, the other one is for Catholics. And um, there is public space, but both parts of the city are governed by a different, uh, different part. So. Um, so, um, so there is public space, but what you see is that in one half of the city they add symbols to public space that is actually inappropriate and doesn't fit the history. And, uh, and at the other place, at the other half of the city, UNESCO rebuilt, the, uh, rebuilt the, the destroyed area in completely the same way as it was before. Um, and what the European Union said, they wanted to create a central zone in the middle of the city, which is neutral, uh, where both parts of the city um, should come together. There is a lot of public space there, but it's not being used uh, because it's, it, it, it doesn't belong to anyone. It just belongs to, they don't see as it, it, as it's like of one of them. So, um, yeah. Is there any value in rebuilding areas of the city that were destroyed in the same way that they existed. So post-conflict you have churches and mosques and citadels. Is there, in your opinion, any value in rebuilding them? Of course there is a value in rebuilding it, but I think you should never rebuild it in the same way as it was. Uh, because the war changes people, it changes us. You shouldn't see the, the war as a, um, as a border in time, but as a, as a moment in history that we also um, so you should in, in in rebuilding it. So um, I I would I think it's the best way to, when you rebuild a building that or heritage that it should be that you see different layers of history in the building. Thank you, uh, Kaiser. You work uh, your work is related to heritage, uh, and you are the head of the Department of Culture at the National Heritage Board in Sweden. Uh, do you agree uh, that the, a special approach needs to be taken when rebuilding? Uh, buildings that were destroyed during conflict. Yeah, exactly, because I think it, uh, whether you should rebuild or, or not, it depends on the purpose. If your purpose is to understand something, then you should rebuild it. Uh, or, or if it makes certain activity easier, I mean, for like praying, if people find that, that that's important for their well-being, then it should be re restored. It. But if you restore in order to uh, make it like it was before some a certain point then I think and I, and I hope I'm not offending someone then I think it's 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 much ill as actually destroying because what you're using doing is that you're erasing what's happened in the history because what we have to remember is that heritage is not buildings it's not sites is about our collective memory. It's about storytelling with the help of a timeline. Yes, connecting yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's what heritage is about. So uh, destroying is, it could, is an important part of this storytelling. On a practical, On a practical level, how do we uh, understand this collective memory and turn it into an urban development plan um, and what part does heritage have to play or should heritage have to play? At the moment, uh, at the very least in, in Beirut, it's the uh, businessmen who are involved in deciding how the city is rebuilt. Um, who else should be involved or who instead of them should uh, To be honest, I think it must be uh, many, many different voices because it's, it's one of my beliefs that the nearest objectivity you can by combining many subjective voices. Uh, it's difficult for some voices to have this objective opinion. And, and I think in, in times of uh, changing and uncertainty, uh, need for looking back in, in the mirror, it, 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 it increases. Uh, and two way, either you can use the history as an comfy couch that you just sit on and dream of history 
and not dealing with the present. Or you can use the history by understanding what's happening at the moment, because that's now is heritage, not just. Um, last but not least, uh, we will hear from Hamad Mufti, who, like many of us, moved a couple of years ago and moved to Beirut. Um, so you've experienced Beirut as a resident. What parts of the redevelopment of the city since, uh, since the end of their civil war would you very strongly suggest be avoided when we come to rebuild Aleppo? Um. I think the comparison is okay. uh, I think it's a bit um, early to do because the, what happened in Beirut is has stopped while what's happening in uh, and the nature of the conflict in Syria is very different from Lebanon. So uh, what uh, let's say what happened in Lebanon is plastering areas in the city stitching some parts of the city, restoring buildings, which are only objects. But uh, as Rania said, my colleague, there, there wasn't, an, um, uh, let's say, concept, a national concept that should be followed on every single spot in every single region, which will, it, it, it will have to play its role in the future of Lebanon. So in Syria, it's very uh, different today. It's very complicated today because the nature of the conflict is permanently evolving. And even the front lines are evolving according to uh, the people interfering, I mean, the, the war and the sides in the war. Uh, what is the most important thing to define in, uh, in any future city, I mean, in Syria, whether Aleppo or other damaged cities, is, uh, is more, it's beyond the city itself. It's the national, national concept of the country. Uh, what's the purpose of the country, what's the goals of the country, and what sh should each city or metropole uh, play its role. We know that Aleppo was a metropole for a very long time and maybe at some point became obsolete because uh, with technologies, with ev evolutions, where it lost a bit its role, plus geographically, etc. So today, thinking that Aleppo will come back as it was, it's a dream, it's uh, obsolete. So it's part of, let's say, the, the normal evolution and or revolution of the urbanism. Because people have left, demographically change. So who are the people who are going to be the new population of Aleppo? With what goal? What will they be doing? Uh, uh, what kind of business? What kind of... Uh, so it's very different. You refer to front lines. In your opinion, uh, when it comes to rebuilding mm -hmm. post-conflict, um, is it important to find a way to almost physically erase those lines? And I sense that the front line in Beirut is not erased, that people still refer to East and West and they don't just mean it geographically. Do we feel that there should be a conscious effort made to ensure those are eradicated, both uh, physically and metaphorically? You're talking about a city in particular? Uh, Aleppo? Uh, uh, yes, but also in general it would apply as a concept post-conflict. Do you try and uh, forget that that war happened, bring people together? Um, uh, Aleppo is actually, you, you mentioned, in, uh, in a way, in a better position, has an advantage that people have left, which means when you bring them back, you can possibly organize it so that they come back, not uh, one one community on one side, another community on another, but you actually build the kind of housing that encourages um, community cohesion or interaction. Or So for me, that would mean get rid of the front line that's trying to erase it. But I, I may well be wrong. And to Qaisar and Arna on that in terms of heritage. Uh, but what are your thoughts on that? I think the front lines in, uh, in Aleppo, let's say, or in any, any other city in Syria, are a bit artificial because on the, uh, how do you call it, power of the warriors, let's say. It's not an ideology line, it's not the wall of Berlin, it's not, uh, it's not what uh, in uh, ex Yugoslavia, it's not different. So, and it's permanently evolving, and the people are not separated sec by, sec uh, by, let's say, ethnic or, or even class. Uh, so, um, I think the front line today is still artificial, it's still not rooted. 
is no good. It might, with, if the conflict lasts for a very long time, it might be a, a huge gap. So we, then the stitch, this part of the city will be a real problem to be thought of as, as let's say, a focus. But I don't think we're there yet. We're beyond. <laughs> I think the, the main risk for Aleppo, because if you want to define Aleppo, it would have been the, the, lo the longest living city in, in human history. Well, there's a, between Damascus and, and Aleppo, but let's consider that. But this conflict created an interruption in what I would call a lived living heritage. And this is where the main uh, danger lies. Because this is a, a city that was living its heritage day by day in daily activities and, and life with a whole range of a social uh, background of people. And now, because they left and they will come back, how will they come back? Who will come back? The cost of, of restoring this, will, will it make it an elitist place? Or will it also involve all the layers that used to live it as a normal place? Because this is what was the thing about Aleppo, that you walk in most beautiful space in, that has thousands of years, like if it is a totally normal city. And that's the big loss that happened somehow of this interruption in history. Anna, who fun oh, I'm sorry, who funded the rebuild of Mostar? In Beirut, uh, a big part of it was uh, private uh, entities. In Mostar, was it municipality? The no, the European Union. Yeah. Does that, does that make a difference to the experience? So in Beirut, uh, it was private. In Mostar, it was EU money. Does that uh, have a different result? Does that mean that the resulting city has well, a different vibe? Yeah, I think so, because here uh, mostly it's private, like you said, so what comes back uh, are these huge uh, residential towers. And in uh, Mostar, they really try to, uh, try to get the old functions uh, that the heritage had, so uh, old gymnasium becomes a gymnasium again, and a house of culture becomes a, a, a different cultural place, but a cultural place again. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's the big difference. Yeah, and also in Mostar, there there is not, uh, there are no investors like like here. Yeah. Just I want to rectify one thing. Beirut is not private. Solidaire is not private. Solidaire is a company that will give it back to the public. It's, the funny thing is that it is perceived as private because of a certain way they cut the roads and the difficulty of access, the the like security. In I mean the way it is. Uh, done and the the phasing in it. There's multitude of element, but it's, it is uh, going to be given to the public. It will become all public domain in uh, in 80 years since it started. So it's not. It's a private initiative. Uh, it's like taken on behalf of the public, but it will be restored to the public. But the whole perception looks like it's private. Well, and this is the whole trick. You're talking about ownership. We're talking about decision making. In terms of decision making, it was privatized. The people did not have a voice. They were not consulted. Sociologists were not consulted. Anthropologists were not consulted. Archaeologists were avoided. So it's, the idea is not who's going to own it in 80 years. In my opinion, it's the decision makers have to be. Uh, of course it is, but the life of a city is not at the scale of a person. The life, the people always recover their city. I mean, the city has a lifespan much bigger than a decision making. You know, it's, this is what's nice about it, that it lives and then it extends and things happen that wasn't predictable <coughs> because of the people at the end. They're the one that will kind of live in it and but interact. I, I it. think it's very interesting, the question that you asked, who is going to come back? Uh, because um, what you see in Mostar was that so much has been destroyed that a lot of people did not want to come back because they didn't recognize their city uh, like it was or they, they didn't see any acceptance in the city that the war was there. Yeah. So I think it's very important for when a city is being to think of to think of this. This is what uh, Kaiser was saying, sorry one second, that he was saying to have a look at heritage as a comfort. 
in a way that that seeing things that you already know confers you in a way to come back. Mm -hmm. While we want to think a city as a contemporary city and have it all new with new material and stuff, but there's the whole comfort mm -hmm. of psychological comfort of seeing things that we already have experienced as a city, as a memory. At this point, I think we've all got a, a general idea of uh, experiences and viewpoints, um, and we really want to open it to the floor to hear from you both your thoughts and experiences and questions for the expert panel. Before we take your questions, Alex is going to give us a summary of what we've heard, uh, just to motivate us to, uh, to ask uh, more in-depth questions. <laughs> sure, okay, so that, let's keep the motivation going. Tell us, Fuad, what's your question? Uh, I thought it's a comment and question. Um, um, the two examples... Sorry, uh, Alex, could you kind... Thank you. Um, my name is Fuad. Uh, so the two examples actually that uh, in, raised here, Beirut and Bosnia, I mean, Mostard, I, like, uh, they both suffer from the same issues that divided, you know, and people, you know, didn't. And so the question is, is there any example that, you know, about post-conflict that something different that come mixed, you know, together for their city? This is first. Second one is about, you know, Aleppo. Actually, the, you know, Aleppo before a uh, war, um, it's so, it's, um, it's, divi it's divided uh, according to socioeconomic, more than, I mean, there's some ethnic uh, uh, um, uh, neighborhoods, like the Ashrafiye or, or Sheikh Masood, uh, and some also Christian neighborhoods that are a bit isolated, like in a ghetto. But also the, the main uh, phenomenon there is the socio-economic division, where eastern part is poor and western part is rich, and our middle class. So the issue now that the, the, the part that are completely destroyed, or it's 70 percent, 80 percent, are the poor area. Mm -hmm. So that um, so question to Mohammed is about how you think that when rebuilding the issue if rebuilding that one day. So how can uh, you know, use the issue of social uh, as a concept to rebuild the city? Thank you. Um, uh, again, the, um, if you look at Aleppo's map, the latest today, according to the conflict, uh, there's a citadel, and there are three, four kilometers north, there's the Kurd area. And on the left part, west and south, the area is controlled still by the regime. And in between, there's another curve going like that. That is controlled by all the other sides. So it's all on war, actually. If you look in who is occupying or living in both areas, you see there is a mixity. Because there was, how do you déplace it? Displacement. The, the displacement from both sides. So demography things got. Both displacement happened much more in the eastern part. True. That's now, but in the first phase, there was some displa uh, displacement as well. So um, obviously, if you want to rebuild Aleppo, you have to put or any city. I just say it again. Restoring the stone, restoring the issue. It's not the problem. It's what of city are we looking for now? Is it Aleppo as it was? It won't be. Is it Aleppo with its same classes and same divisions? It will never be again. So there must be a new concept for the city. Is it, will it be a new modernized uh, metropole like it was a long time ago with highest technologies? Will it be an open air museum like, let's say, Rome? Exaggerating a little bit. It will change completely the demography and the kind of occur. The most important thing today in Aleppo and in Homs and Haman, everything, is to put ideas for national territory, not only for the city itself. This is um, how I see it. I actually have a question for, for Arna. I'm speaking. 
Rim? Oh, no. sorry. You have the mic. I have the mic. Um, I have a question for Arna, actually, tying on um, what we were talking about on Monday. Um, you said that I think in Mostar, after rebuildment, I mean, what, how would you describe what's like the new language in Mostar post conflict? You said, for example, buildings that had like no ethnicity or, or religious connection seem to have a better chance there. Could you sort of explain what you think is, is the new language that's actually working? considering how divided the city was? Um, yeah, but well, what you see is that the buildings that... Can you hear me well? Yeah. Buildings that had a, a, a really cultural function, so... Okay, so use, use mine. So what you see that every building that had that was really heritage um, is now really uh, has this really um, um, how do you say it balade how, how would you charged. yeah really charged uh, so what you see is that both sides of of, ta of the town try to try to put their own meaning and identity on every uh, cultural building and um, and the buildings that didn't have a meaning before um, seem now the best, the best ones to, to that that can be the most useful in the future because they didn't uh, they didn't have a meaning before. Yeah, like the statue. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're looking for. <laughs> oh, but can you give a couple of examples? An example or two? Well, um, there was in Bosnia, in Mostar, um, they wanted to make a monument, um, but they couldn't decide on who, uh, who, who it should be. Should it be a Muslim, a Croat, or a Serb? So what they then thought was, okay, we all watched Bruce Lee movies before, so they made a Bruce Lee uh, monument. And it's, yeah, it's, it's really true. <laughs> so it's now it's in the middle of the city, in the neutral zone, it's actually what the what the harsh thing is about it. It's that is that it's completely denying the past. So how can I relate to Bruce Lee when Bruce Lee never was he he, he was never in Mostar. Probably he he doesn't even he didn't even know what, where Mostar wa was. So how could I relate to uh, to someone like Bruce Lee even even if I've watched his movies? Bruce Lee, so sane, so yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point. They have a lot of humor. Mm. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the important things we have to take into account is uh, that there are three in Syria, probably in the Middle East, uh, which remind the world or remind the Syrians that uh, we are the only ones who have made history uh, that we have always been there. This is a little bit a confrontation of what the Israelis pretend always to have been here for some time. In fact, there are three cities in the Middle East that show that the only people who were doing civilization is the people around Damascus, around Aleppo, around Hama, so these are the very important cities, probably also with Jerusalem. Now, when you want to come back and reconstruct Aleppo, you have to keep this in mind, in the sense that Aleppo has to retain its figure as a very historical city, 6,000, 8,000 years old, etc. So the m big monuments, like the citadel, the mosque, some of the churches, etc., have to be restored. And uh, a big difference with the Beirut experience is that in Aleppo, people are... And so essentially, I go with the idea that in the rich quarters of Aleppo, people are still better off and have little destruction, while in the poor section of the city, uh, the, the city was destroyed, which makes it a little bit easier to reconstruct because you're not reconstructing something that is relatively modern. Uh, essentially, the old souks are destroyed in part and the poor part of the city. Now, I have to correct one thing, that the people of Aleppo did not leave Aleppo. If we forget about the 100,000 bourgeois 
uh, or a little bit well off, could afford leaving, essentially most of the others are either in the western part of Aleppo, where the government is uh, still there, or have moved into Turkey or other places, but we are talking here about some 30% of the city inhabitants, and the percent are still around. Essentially, the Aleppans did not leave Aleppo as such. But the problem is the educated people in have left the city. And for the young ones among them, of course, the, the businessmen even, etc., they tend to come back because it's the only place where they know how to do business, where they know how to work. But the problem is with the young people who leave and after some time, they manage to learn good foreign languages, so they tend to stay and not come back. This is the main issue. If you want to attract people to come back with the reconstruction, then we have to create a sort of relatively developed jobs in mm. order to attract them back. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, Kaiser, do you have a reaction to that? Yeah. I was I'm actually curious about whether it's possible to recreate something. Um, I mean, I mean that's one of the things with history. Eh? It's constantly, right? Uh, but if you look at the heritage issue, it, it has been used as a national narrative or an ethnic narrative uh, where you put certain things in history and tell that, that this is what defines us. I mean, we, us being from Aleppo or Syrian or Christian or Muslim or whatever. But, but that's rather kind of new idea. Uh, I mean, people living in Aleppo for 5,000 years, uh, it's, it's difficult to see if they perceive them the same way as people do today. And, 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 and one thing, I, th I, I think Beirut and Mostar is really... Uh, interesting examples because they've chosen different paths. Where in Mostar we have restored something that was, while in Beirut uh, they're trying to create something else, not restoring in that order. And I'm not sure which one is best. Um, Mohammed, do you think it's important to restore the heritage of Aleppo? Would it be so bad if it turned into Dubai? Uh, if we had the investment, if it if they really, all the destroyed areas, they just went up with modern buildings, sky rises? No, it would be a disaster not to restore it. But, uh, of course, the, it's obvious, I mean, um, but restore it for what? Obviously, we have to restore it. But to restore it for what kind of city? Is it a livable city with a commercial activity, with a social activity, or a museum, open-air museum, or a new city that is parallel? Let's look at uh, Amsterdam or Rotterdam after the Second World War, or European city that was completely involved and let's say a new cities, new towns built after World War. We see that urban is very different from urban construction. So, and it takes much more li uh, longer to rehabilitate uh, a city than to construct a new city. So there is a phase that there will be time for probably a, a generation. A new city that will be parallel to the restoration the old city. I mean, just uh, it's, uh, it's, it's mathematics. I mean, it, it will take a longer time because there's infrastructure, there's a lot of things. There's... So during this period, demographically, things will evolve a lot. Now, this evolution, will it be according to a plan or will it be, let's say, uh, avoidable? Uh, this will be. This is the question. I think this. The answer is too early to answer it. It depends on the nature of the uh, resolution of the conflict. Lauren, do you have a question or a thought to share? Thank you. Um, it's comment for Rani, Director Rania. Um, we haven't really talked much about. Um, uh, uh, financial in reconstruction as a financial incentive for peace, um, which is an idea that has been floating around here a little bit recently, um, whereby the idea is that uh, you know, uh, investment and financial opportunities in reconstruction actually provide an incentive to end conflict um, greater than the incentive for the kind of profits and more that, that, that are resulting from the conflict itself now. 
um, the argument could be made that to a certain extent that had a role, that acted into the end of the conflict in Lebanon. Um, so my question for Rani really is how successful do you can use financial incentive or, or a capitalist approach to rebuilding a city for long-term reconciliation or peace building? I mean, is, can that be successful? Well, uh, we have to acknowledge that economics plays a big role in urbanisms. And uh, the whole point is to have a strong enough vision of a city and a government that puts, in, that puts incentive in a reconstruction to allow people to be involved in the process and to allow them space uh, in terms of affordable housing, in terms of public space and transportation, and in terms of their right to the city. So, uh, like, if you, if you consider, like, Solidaire is an is a elitist place, if the government at some point has more incentive on it, uh, it would have obliged a percentage of housing in it. And by doing that, it would have created a different dynamic of the, for the place than the one it is now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all about, because in, at the end of the day, it will be a lot of money involved to build re, uh, infrastructure. And that's the, this huge cost of um, making it uh, too expensive to live in for most of the population, and then to alienate them. It's a big risk on these reconstruction of places. So I think this is why it, the most important thing is to have a social uh, approach and strategy along with it that will keep the rights of the, the population as the right of the, to the city. Uh, uh, that, it, that is a major component. Uh, but as a response also, uh, that is there any successful example? Well, I, I would believe that I would respond to you that would Beirut would be in 50 years. I mean, because the whole plan, I mean, we don't want to think that it's a failure just because now it hasn't accomplished the purpose because sooner or later, the people will take back their city center, either when they reconstruct the waterfront, when they will have much more connectivity from the uh, of the Saifi, I mean, when you will have uh, Martyr Square built up, when you will have the continuity of the the Zaytuni Bay built up, people will come back to the city. And the whole plan is not there yet. So I think the spam, what we're looking at now, might look like a failure in terms of sociologically speaking, but it's because maybe, because we have to look at it like much wider time to assess if it's a proper failure or not. Because like, like Mohammed was saying, the construction physical is very easy. I mean, it take what? 15, 20, 20 years, but people to come back and get back their memory and b get back their footprint in a city will be much, much to heal their, their scar as well, will take much longer. This is why I, I would tell you Beirut would be a success. Tenasi. <laughs> Thank you, Rania. Tenasi. How's that? That's great. Okay, uh, I'm Thanasi. Uh, there's, there's a presumption in this conversation that there's a process that can be shaped as opposed to a organic process observed. Uh, and I'm not convinced that there is an effective role that anyone can play as an external actor in shaping this, and your stories of Mostar uh, argue for that. And I would say the story of Beirut as well, where Solidaire is, in my view, an abject failure, and then you have a city that is successes which are relatively organic or indigenous or, or come from uh, actual economic activity rather than corrupt rentier mega projects. Uh, so, you know, on the, on the, on the one, I have, I have two questions. One is, do you really think there's, there's a for anyone to play in shaping this process of, from an overarching framework standpoint? Um, and second of all, how do you deal with the, the historical fact, the historical reality that can and have killed cities? There have been cities that were active organisms where people did things and made things, and afterwards they were dead. 
like Beirut, which is a city that, that was once a, a, a creative place in the sense of wealth and, and, and knowledge and things, and today it is not. Today it, it, it's not a dead city, uh, it's not a, a creative uh, organism. And, and you might disagree with that uh, framework entirely, but, but, but if, if, if you don't, I'd love, to hear, I'd love to hear how you do see it. Uh, and if you do, what do you do about a city that's, uh, uh, that's dead and, and will continue on in a different function that's not that of an organic living uh, creative entity? Qaisar, uh, if you could ask you uh, from a generic uh, perspective in terms of heritage, uh, how would you respond to Tanasi's question? I would say that it's, it's actually impossible not to relate to whether you want to forget or remember. Uh, I mean, Mostar is a good example. Um, last Monday you showed some other pictures where, where the Yugoslavian identity was tried um, built upon uh, objects that didn't have any religious uh, connotations at all. But, but, but that didn't work out. Uh, so, uh, I mean, an answer to your question, I, I think you have to deal with um, even bad memories in order for them not to come back and bite you and several years, years later. Uh, I don't know if you could follow up. My understanding, Tanasi, is, is basically asking um, how cities lose their cultural um, identity as a result of the conflict. Uh, since we're talking about urban planning, how much can we plan our uh, physical space to encourage a vibrancy of culture as opposed to what conflict uh, naturally makes happen, and that's a, a death of conflict, uh, of art rather. Not, not just culture. I mean, uh, creation meaning wealth creation, economic, based on death, and, and culture really being a corollary of that. Well, I probably don't have a, the right answer to your question, but I think that public space really plays a crucial role uh, in recovering a city. Um, what I see in, um, when I, I, I can use as the, as the best example for this, is that um, it was like this, that uh, buildings with a really, buildings that shaped the identity of, of people living there were bombed to erase certain history. Um, well, I think it's really important those buildings again but in a in a new way um, because it's it's also it's shared history you know so the the war um, so I think it, it, it these this these uh, buildings and the way that they are rebuilt that they get a public function um, so I think public space is really crucial in in um, in giving this new cultural uh, in giving yeah new opportunities for culture development and economical, and I, I, I cannot answer your complete question because it's, it's all also dependent on, on who's, who's, uh, who has the power in a city. Um, Hamad, what public spaces existed in Aleppo before that are now under threat of not being redeveloped? Uh, just before answering that, I would like to yes. just to add something. I think it's a bit early to, uh, to according to what happened in Lebanon. It's not working. Okay. I think it's a bit too early to, uh, to uh, let's say, what's the role of Lebanon, uh, Beirut, let's say. And, uh, but I believe in something that every city, since it's populated, then it has a reason to be. I think uh, there's a major process that is happening in this whole region as an identity redefinition, whether national identity or individual identity or mass social anthropology identity plus a nation identity. So I think things are, have to take their, their, their time to be and to be answered. But uh, today I don't, I don't totally agree with you that Beirut is no more uh, the, uh, let's say, a flourishing culturally uh, city. It's still playing a very major role and this is why it hosted a lot of, let's say, uh, Syrians uh, and and those Syrians had the occasion to express themselves in theater, concerts, uh, whatever. So still, uh, Beirut is a hub. Maybe it's playing a different role than it used to be, 
this is normal because the whole ident the whole region is to be redefined uh, identity wise this is uh, just i wanted to add this identity issue it's important so uh, ah no we do have a question but i suspect Rania wants to interject on the question of beirut tenasi that if you have a major accident and you somehow you have a you you break your uh, your uh, your back and you have other scars you have to have a major intervention on on your back and you let your other scars heal by themselves you know that uh, you there is it's a mixed use of different intervention that you need to to have a city scar and heal itself and in different process and in different ways uh, and it will all depend on contemporary Contemporary economics also has changed, and people has changed. I mean, uh, in terms of the souks used to be like the spicy souks, or and now you have a global economy of. Uh, you know, you, it, the whole world has changed. I mean, if you take 30 years ago, we didn't have. I mean, the whole world has a different perception of globalization that you need to incorporate in an, in a, in a city. I think you have to, and as as Muhammad was saying, you have to allow it time. This is, I think, the main factor that we are not giving enough uh, credit for, that it's not going to heal in, in 10 years or um, in wherever. And the planification is only for the infrastructure, which is very important. You need electricity, you need water, you need sewage plant, you need, I mean, all this has to be planned as a major intervention in a city. Then you bring people to live in public space and to get used to it, how to have more trees, or this will be an intervention that will come with time and habit, you know? But you cannot go without a certain form of planification that is major. If I may, sorry, just ask uh, my question again to Muhammad about public spaces. What public spaces existed in Aleppo that are under threat of not being rebuilt post-conflict? in our culture um, uh, the public spaces in the new cities or the new districts in Aleppo or in Homs or Damascus are designed by the Cité Jardin uh, concept of new cities etc which is an uh, let's say urban concept and urban urban uh, lifestyle let's say and it's not very adapted to our culture so it's true there are squares and small parks and and uh, whatever in the in, Sy in Syria all over but these are not occupied as they would be if they were in Europe okay so our public space even if there are parks it's not the parks it's the streets people belong to streets not to uh, to parks uh, lovers don't meet in a they might they are only they are the only ones who meet in, in parks but people live in the streets. Coffees are in the street. Uh, Hakawati are in the streets. Everything is in the street. So, uh, what is more important, really, as, uh, yeah, answering your question, is how to make people really occupy the street and uh, relive the public space as it is. Thank you. Uh, do we have a question? Yes, Daniel. Uh, we have a mic for you here. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I have, have a seat, Daniel. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I have a question uh, also to the people here because, I mean, we at the Fair Fabric, and the, w the reason why we initiated this project was to talk also about what kind of infrastructure are we constructing ourselves into the future, meaning that as soon as you have, a, a, I mean, a devastated city like Mostar, what happens? Our partners are telling us you start to construct the city immediately, and now 20 years later, the urban planners are telling, saying. Okay, we reconstructed physically infrastructure, but we don't have the content. We missed that opportunity of asking ourselves, how do we connect our narratives into the future infrastructure that we're going to build? This is also the reason why we created this I mean, panel debate, to talk about the, the meaning of the narratives, the meaning of, like you say, from transporting those narratives from yesterday now to tomorrow and to the infrastructure. So I want to connect before we sometimes before we start to reconstruct and construct and construct how do we connect what kind of narratives are connected to the societies to these histories what kind of infrastructure we're we building ourselves into and this is not just about Alep or Mostar or Beirut it's the same thing about Stockholm when you're building a highway what kind of infrastructure we connect ourselves into the future when you, if this
participate in this kind of segregation or not? This is, I think, the question we need to make at the very beginning before we start constructing. Do you think, Arna, that they should have waited before implementing an EU-funded urban plan for Mostar? Yeah, definitely. I think it, it, it would be good if there was like this research done before they started rebuilding. Like, what is important to rebuild? How are you going to rebuild? What kind of function should it have? I think that's very important because, for example, the, the things that I'm the most afraid of is that when I go to uh, Sarajevo, for example, the main city of Bosnia is that I don't see a lot signs from the war anymore so when I when I'm there I'm like well, if I was I didn't know that the war was there I, I probably wouldn't even notice it and that's the thing I'm the most afraid of that they're gonna do in Mostar that that it's not visible anymore so that you're that, that people are gonna so I think this story of the history of a city is very important to keep in mind when you, when you start rebuilding. But how do you rebuild and keep some kind of memory of the war there without it continuing to divide people? Um, I, think that, um, I think that you, sh you could do it in a way that you, you don't use sides. So for example, um, there's in Berlin, there's the Neues Museum, and they rebuilt it in this very nice way that you see different layers of in the museum, so you don't see only one layer of history, but you see all the layers of history. So I think that's a, that's a way to do it. I said, what's your experience with this? Uh, no, but the thing is that uh, I understand what you're arguing for is not restoring into something that was before, where division was was visual, right? The, uh, the thing is that to elaborate and, and to ask question, why are we doing this? Why are we restoring this and that building? Again, I mean, it's not that our heritage or the sites. It's, it's our national narrative. And we have to ask, in, in what purpose are we rebuilding? For example, the most is it to restore the bridge or is it to make it possible for people to jump from it? I mean, that, these are two different perspectives. I believe, thank you, Khaisar. I believe we've got time for two more questions. Uh, yes, at the back there. But uh, if you just while we get your mic. Hello, hello. Hey, uh, OK. I'd just like to go back for, for, and answer the gentleman question. Uh, actually, I want to int introduce myself first. Um, my name is Samar Sam al uh, I was born and raised in Aleppo. I'm a fine artist. And uh, actually, after leaving and uh, moving to Beirut uh, since like two years, I'm just more aware of what my heritage is and how I feel for my, for my city. And I just can't wait to get back and reconstruct everything. For now, I'm, I'm developing myself. I'm working so hard. I've never, I've never been motivated. Like war is the most thing that motivates you at some point. So I just want, we're all talking about buildings and that's, that's very important, our heritage. When, when I see it, when I, when I imagine Aleppo, I always think of the citadel, and this is my background. My background, and if the citadel is not there, then it's uh, it's a part of my identity, and it's all, and also has many layers because it's very old, and it already has many layers. So uh, I just I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Does uh, anyone have more thoughts to share or question for a member of the panel? Thank you. It's on. Okay. Tari, I'm an architect. Um, I mean, I think, well, I mean, the things that we're referring to in I mean, uh, Beirut, the problem is, according to me, the winner wasn't one, wasn't unique. I think no one won and no one lost. And this is why you still, I think, still see those divisions in the, in the, in the city and reflections of, of the ideology of each, probably. But and, and like downtown was like didn't really belong to anyone probably during that period of emptiness of the of the war. And anyways, so what happens if Aleppo there is no clear winner? But this would be the. the <laughs> I suggest that we use that as a, a very 
poignant last question which each of our panelists can can answer. Uh, thank you, Tariq, for that question. Uh, a difficult one. Shall we start with Rania just uh, to go down the line? Maybe if there's no winner, then we can, the city will be a winner. Then we will consider that the, the heritage is a winner. I mean, if we... Yeah, but if we decide that there's no perception of conflict, that it didn't take side, uh, then everybody can, b can get back and live together somehow. Uh, you just need to keep holding on. <laughs> well, this is the response yes. to him. I, think I need to keep holding on. <laughs> so I think, uh, well, I think there's, th there's always a perception that some of us in, it depends on who uh, the, the consensus, but I think the reconstruction um, is, o is, is also about integrating everybody in this uh, process of re reconstruction that is important because the more you feel involved in reconstructing, like, like, like uh, the gentleman was saying, the more it's important to you as a heritage as and the more you don't want it to go back to of, of construction or war or conflict of anything because you, you know now the value of everything you have somehow lost for a period of time and maybe this is what it is, this identity that is the most important thing, the, this new perception of this identity that you need to redefine. I suppose one of the reasons it's very important who wins, if that can even be used as a term, um, in the case of Syria is that will decide who returns. Many, Dr. Sami, you said they haven't completely left, but who returns to occupy eastern Aleppo or stays in western Aleppo will be influenced by who the winner, uh, greater power is after the war. Uh, would you agree, Mohammed? Yeah. Because who, whoever the winner is, he will have to project a project for their nation. And some people might not fit anymore in this project. So they will continue their lives where they are. Uh, but what you said, Tare, is the worst case scenario. It's, uh, it's the nightmare. Because if there's no winner and no, I mean, no declaration of ending of everything, then the city will be completely destroyed with time. Because today, since there's no plan, if you stop everything today, the war, without dealing, without a deal, uh, declaring who lost and who won, there will, no be, there will not be any national project no national vision. So any construction will be a destruction for the heritage. So the city will, like, um, it will turn off more and more till it uh, becomes a random city. Uh, how do you feel, Arna, that the uh, conclusion of the war in Bosnia is reflected in the way that the cities and societies were rebuilt? Um, yes, so Tara's question is what if there is no winner? So we're talking about the result of the war, any war, um, influencing the, uh, the way the redevelopment occurs. So in the case of Bosnia, how do you feel that the result or the conclusions of the war were reflected uh, or influenced the way that the cities were redeveloped? Well, I think it, it yeah, I, I'm not happy with how it it would how it went because there are actually there there wasn't a real winner because the city got divided but you're saying that it's the worst case scenario but i'm if there's no winner but i'm really doubting if it's the scenario or the best case scenario because <laughs> if it's the uh, if the if if the um, if there is a real winner then it means that the city will choose a certain side and I'm really wondering if that's the, the best way to do it because, and also I think there can never be a clear winner because people are traumatized, people are going to leave, um, people that stay behind are traumatized. The demographically it's completely changed. So there, there will never be a clear winner. No, one, one can just hope for that none of the existing groups feels like they're the winner. Uh, like we heard, it's, I think the future is going to be difficult. And, and, and one can also hope that the common good will be the new winner. But, but the tricky question is, how do you, we define common good? 
And, and what I suggested in the beginning, it's letting many subject voices actually to be heard. We have one last question we're going to sneak in, despite the time limit. Rola, please. Um, actually, I just wanted to answer Tariq's question. Hi, Tariq. Um, I really think... Is that... Uh, yeah, maybe. All right. Uh, so I really think that uh, it doesn't matter who wins, because, you know, you might think that you won, but they might think that they won as well. So it doesn't really matter. What really matters is the amount of destruction. It's been two years now, three years. Destruction is happening, not only to it, but also to social tissues. So I think that the answer is, I am not the one to give the answer, but the, the methodology is to, do, uh, to go and do field work. Before we can get to Aleppo and do very extensive field work in order to understand what has been destroyed, then we can come up with strategy. And that, I think that this round table is actually for us who feel sorry for Aleppo. We want to talk about Aleppo and about Syria. And, uh, and it feels good. But I think that once we can go and we can penetrate Syria and Aleppo, then we can really come up with strategies uh, of reconstruction. Otherwise, it's all going to be destructions. Uh, I think that is... Wait, just, just also, just to finalize this here. Uh, also to your answer, because I think what's really interesting, unfortunately, I know, hope in most of the times, I mean, the conflicts, there is one loser among the population and it's the woman, and when you reconstruct the cities, those cities are planning, even if we talk about the proper infrastructure or narratives, they are not including those voices. And I think when reconstructing any kind of cities that have suffered from this, you really have to add a specific gender perspective in doing that, because otherwise, you will for sure, even if there is a winner, there will be half of the population a loser. Having brought in these two new concepts of uh, gender perspective and field work, I feel uh, that I should give you each an opportunity to respond. Uh, do we have interjections? Yeah. Hold Obviously, on. Obviously, what, what we're, <laughs> I mean, what we're saying is, um, is theoretical and it's the lesson. But any uh, reconstruction will need a contextual approach, which is field work. I mean, this is the because no city is like any other and no, no vision of it. So the, the field work is, is obvious to restart any process of reconstruction. This is what we discussed is only what are the things that we can add to the layer of field work in order to have even a better or faster uh, way of reliving this city properly. Well, yeah, we touched upon that earlier, uh, but yeah. the field work, who does the field work, implements it, who's involved, who makes the decisions, but that in Beirut it seems to be the businessmen and the politicians, that in Mostar it was very EU-funded vision, but that actually when we go to Aleppo, meaning get the people of Aleppo, if I understand you correctly, Rola, to get them to be involved in all parts of society and all professions. We're all in agreement then. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, this is the procedure. Um, Alex, can we clarify how much time we have? We have about 18 minutes. Okay. So, we have time. We have more questions. My misunderstanding. Um, do we have more questions? We do. Since we have one or two minutes, just to follow up the question of field work and I fully understand the, this, this need to, to consult, to give as many voices as possible the possibility to, to talk um, in, in very, very and please forgive me if I'm too practical here. Uh, of course, there will be a need for, for reconstruction quite quickly by the people. So for instance, in, in Mostar, there you you are not really happy with the EU quick response, which is rather an uncommon critique of EU to be too quick. But uh, how, how would you deal with this kind of a problem of, of, of wanting to give and help people at the very as soon as, as possible, but doing it in a in a smart way? Do you 
you have a, a vision for that, Anna? Yeah, I think there's a difference between rebuilding uh, residential buildings and rebuilding heritage. So I think the heritage should really, there you should really have the field work for. And then of course, like electricity and water and what you have said, those things have to be, yeah, they have to be done quickly. So I think that's really the difference. But I think it's also a good question, who is going to do the field work? Who is going to be in charge of it? Who is going to make the decisions? So is it going to be the, 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 the winner? Or is it going to be the European Union? Or is it going to be some neutral party? Or is it going to be um, a mix of different disciplines that, that has knowledge about it? Uh, or, so I think that's also uh, an important question to ask. So for the second time this evening, do we have any final thoughts, uh, parting thoughts for our audience before we uh, listen to a lovely poem about Aleppo uh, by Dr. Fouad Wad? Then thank you very much. I, I just want to say that I think the interesting thing is that the fieldwork is supervised by something that the European Union, which doesn't exclude any side of the country, uh, so this way you will, we will do the, the whole the, uh, job holistically. So you will have an expert of technocrat that will give an opinion on, on, on it, but it was supervised by a neutral uh, zone that so it doesn't give neither the winner, neither the loser. It gives them uh, incentives and part of the reconstruction of the city. Uh, so it's, it's reconstructing physical space is not reconstructing city because city is made of people and buildings. So it's both of them and lifestyle. So I think this is it. It's to be monitored in a way by something that more to give everyone its share. Who is monitoring? Is it the government or is it the private sector? This is a well, lesson. The monitor is a, is a, is in the case of Mostar, mm -hmm. it, it has been the, the European Union that has funded it, which mm -hmm. is someone so, that didn't take side, hopefully, yeah. in the conflict. So funding uh, and monitoring, they should funding, be different. Monitoring because is, uh, is funding supervised. Is the money is, diff is, is, is dangerous. So, but money can build as much as it can destruct, destroy. I think uh, monitoring is very important, and then comes the question: public or private, or public and private together. I think it's very, you know, it's a it's a very tricky question. But I think that these are really questions that should be asked, and and uh, they should be asked when it's uh, in due time, when field work is possible. Because you know, now uh, situation. It's like that, it's statu quo, like now. But in 30 years, like the case of Beirut, things have changed dramatically. So, and uh, we have several destruction in uh, Lebanon and several reconstruction process. <clears throat> Some of them uh, were very, very, very quick, very quick response, uh, crisis response. Um, you know, the parameter stayed the same, so response is, the, is specific. But when you wait 30 years, and I hope things will not last that long in Syria and that will, they will stop now, uh, but it, it is very different because social tissue and the city and the people and even the memory of things, if that is important, will change 30 years from now. Uh, and that's why, again, field work. This is when why it's it called planning, possible. because it involves yeah. the whole vision of a future in it, in the process. Uh, and what's important about what you say is to separate the investor from the worker from the supervisor. Exactly. So it's three different layers of has to be working in parallel. That will uh, make the techno but, techno but technocratic... But I think you, we have to be uh, you know. very pragmatic about the private has to have its saying. Otherwise, you, can, you cannot have, have an to. economically viable... Vi it doesn't uh, have to. If it adds... Uh, well, I have to tell adds, you, there is no hmm? more government that is powerful enough okay. to, to fund any form of... Uh, unless it's a dictatorship, which I want. Ideally, so it's a marriage between the exactly. government, the private sector, the municipalities, and most importantly, the people, but also specialists, the archaeologists and the sociologists, yeah, particularly as we're talking post-conflict. 
Um, unfortunately, the destruction looks like it's going to continue for a while, but if we use that time wisely to, uh, as we have done somewhat today, start developing a plan or at least a strategy for a plan, then hopefully we'll be ready to begin with the field work once it's safe to go on the ground, um, encourage people to go back and, and rebuild societies. Um, I'm really pleased that tonight we had uh, the opportunity to hear from you all and from the panel. We can certainly continue to discuss over uh, food uh, but at the moment we need to uh, conclude and say thank you very much to the panel Rania Sassin, Mohammed Mufni, Arna Makik and Qaisa Mahmoud.